The Voice of Russia World Service presents another program in the series The Lives of Russian Saints. The program you'll hear today is Father Artemi of the Moscow Theological Academy. Beloved brothers and sisters, this time we'll tell you the story of the holy martyr, the last Russian emperor, Nicholas II. It is quite significant that long before his accession to the throne, a monk at the Glinsk Monastery in Russia, Iliador, chance to have an enigmatic vision at the end of the 19th century. <laughs> Iledor was attending a prayer when he felt some change of his senses. Then he saw a dark horizon. There came bright light. A sun rose in the east and started to move slowly to the west. All of a sudden, the sun grew red, stopped moving, and a voice from above said, This is the road of the royal martyr, Nicholas II. Nicholas II was not understood by the Russian people, and he has remained so to this day. Quite a few books have been written about the last days of the last Tsar. There are so many eyewitness accounts of people who chanced to meet him, generals, members of the court, government ministers. But very few things written about the royal martyr are true. How can one not venerate a Tsar when at the sacramental hour of the coronation he accepts all the attributes of power, the scepter, the orb and the crown, with the words, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then the Tsar reads a prayer full of humbleness and gratitude to God. O Lord, do instruct me in the duty you have sent me to attend. Direct me in this great service. May my heart be in your hands so as to arrange the lives of people I have been entrusted with in a way useful to them and pleasant to you, so that on doomsday I should have no shame answering to you. Emperor Nicholas II, a very religious man, was an example of piety throughout his life. However, when he followed God's providence in everything, many called him arrogant and conservative and perceived his faithfulness as hypocrisy and obscurantism. His submissiveness to the strokes of fate was often seen as evidence of the weakness of his character, indecision and short-sightedness. Nicholas II remained committed to himself, his life by the faith, when he was already held prisoner by the Bolsheviks in 1918. Aware that he would die, he never lost courage, he remained a religious person and treated with love everyone around him. General Tatishev, who courageously followed in his emperor's footsteps to Calvary, one day dared express his surprise about the piety of all members of the royal family. He was amazed to see not a single quarrel and to hear not a single angry word from the royal martyrs. The emperor responded modestly. Even you have just begun to know what kind of people we are. How can I feel angry about the torrents of falsehoods and filth the press has been pouring on our heads? Oh Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing.
It takes a truly religious person to understand the very nature of orthodox autocracy. A republic sets itself the earthly ideal of prosperity and abundance. A democracy puts the emphasis on human rights, but despite itself, it dooms each person to selfishness. Autocracy alone seeks a moral goal, that of bringing up its people not for the earthly kingdom, but for the kingdom up in the heaven. The throne of the Tsar is placed so highly that he, anointed by God, does not reflect the interests of any group or any party. An autocrat is not a despot. He is a father who loves all his children. He prays for them and takes care of all. He knows that in due time he will be responsible to God for all his actions. It was a tragic misunderstanding of the very nature of the God-given power to the Tsar on the part of Russian intellectuals, who kept urging the ordinary people to go astray. It explains the Russian tragedy of the early 20th century. In 1903, Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra arrived in the city of Sarov in central Russia for special ceremonies honoring Reverend Seraphim of Sarov. During that visit, the Tsar was given a note written by Seraphim of Sarov himself, which the saint asked to keep carefully, especially for Nicholas II. The wonder worker Seraphim had been dead for many decades. The Tsar read the note his face turned pale, but he didn't tell anybody what it was all about. Today we know that that note contained a prophecy. Saint Seraphim predicted the Tsar would die the death of a martyr. Nicholas II was never fully happy. He used to say, I have more than a feeling that I am doomed to terrible hardships, for which I will have no reward in this world. Whatever I undertake, I fail to accomplish. I have no good fortune. Anyway, the human will is so weak. Those who revere the memory of our last emperor would certainly find both amazing and important the words he pronounced ten years before 1917. Probably there has to be a sacrifice to save Russia. I'll become that sacrifice with God's will. These words are a clue to glorifying the Tsar already glorified by God. For what makes a human being a saint is sacrificial service to God the readiness to go to the cross for the sake of coping with one's duty. But what was it that made the Tsar so firm in his intention to die for the sake of the Christian truth and for the sake of the country he so much loved? It was a result of the feat of his life, which has been ridiculed and spat on so many times. In 1999, the then 31-year-old Russian Emperor Nicholas II convened an unprecedented conference in The Hague. The conference adopted a general principle of the peace settlement of international disputes. 
That was not the sole example of the genuine Christian love for peace displayed by the emperor. Here is another one. In 1915, when the First World War was raging on, several dozen thousand Serbs were being driven out of their home country. Exhausted by a nightmaric track on foot across the Albanian mountains, they were about to die on the shore. The ships of the Allied powers were idle at the sight of dying Slavs. At that crucial moment, Nicholas II demanded that the Allies should save the Serbs by picking them up on the Albanian coast. He warned that otherwise Russia would withdraw from the war. Dozens of Italian, French and British ships then had to evacuate the Serbian refugees. The Serbian army was saved too. Serbia has always had the grateful memory of that humane act by the Russian emperor. Later, in 1930, the Serbs asked the Synod of their Orthodox Church to bring up the question of canonizing the Russian Emperor Nicholas II. The Serbs revered him as a saint long before Nicholas II was canonized. Many enigmatic events are said to be connected with him. An old Serbian woman was weeping for her sons, killed in the battle. Two of them died, and one was reported missing. After one ardent prayer for her missing son, the woman fell asleep to have a dream of the Russian emperor. Nicholas II told her, Your son is alive. He is in Russia, where he has been fighting together with his brothers, martyrs for the Slav cause. You will not die before you see your boy. Shortly after that dream, the old woman got word that her son was alive. Several months later, she was already embracing him at home, safe and sound. Another case. On August 11th, 1927, a Belgrade daily carried an article entitled The Face of Emperor Nicholas II in the Monastery of St. Norm on Lake Okrida. The article narrated a story told by Russian painter Kolesnikov. The painter was invited to the Monastery of St. Norm to paint 15 medallions on the walls of the church. When fourteen faces of saints were ready and just one more medallion was left, the painter felt some inexplicable feeling that didn't let him finish the work. The last medallion remained vacant for a little while. One evening, when the painter came to the church, he saw something very unusual. The church was dark. The rays of a setting sun lit the dome. The play of light and shadow was charming. Everything around seemed unearthly and strange. The painter glanced at the oval that remained vacant. The medallion suddenly came alive, and in the frame there appeared a sad and beautiful face, the face of Emperor Nicholas II. The painter was struck dumb, not knowing what to think when he saw the miraculous vision of the Russian Tsar who had died the death of a martyr. He felt a strong religious impulse. He took a ladder and, wasting no time on drawing the silhouette of the Tsar's face with coal, he started applying paint with brushes at once. He never went to sleep that night. He dozed off for a little while just before dawn. As soon as he woke up, he hurried to the church again. He worked with tremendous inspiration that he had never had before. Time was nothing to him. Later, Kolesnikov recalled, I painted the portrait without having a photograph with me. In the past, 
I chanced to see the late emperor several times very close, when he visited art exhibitions and I gave my explanations. His image left its imprint on my memory. When I finished the work, I supplied that portrait and icon at the same time with this inscription, Emperor Nicholas II of all Russia, who took the crown of a martyr for the well-being and happiness of the Slavs. Serbian General Ristich, commander of the military district, visited that church several days later. He stood there for a long time, looking at the portrait of the late Russian Tsar, and there were tears running down his cheeks. Then he turned to the painter and said that for the Serbs, Nicholas II was and would be the greatest and most revered of all Russian saints. A Serbian legend has it that every night on the eve of the anniversary of the killing of the Russian royal family, the Russian emperor comes to that cathedral in Belgrade. He comes there to pray in front of the icon of Saint Sava for the Serbian people. After that, he is rumored to go on foot to the headquarters of the Serbian army to see if everything is in order there. Still a small boy, Nicholas liked the images of the Mother of God very much. Later he would admit that he always envied his brother George, because he had such a handsome saint killing a dragon. Those who chanced to meet with the Tsar in person were amazed by the love he had for each God's creature, and his considerate attitude to each person and his great love for his country and its people. An ambitious plan of Russia's industrialization was brought to the Tsar for signature one day in 1908. The emperor studied the scheme and said, Peter the Great had little money and used forced labor. That cost him one million lives of his subjects. Our plans would cost 10 to 15 million of premature deaths of my people. I'm in my right mind and I cannot make this sacrifice. Therefore we have to be patient and count on God. In contrast to Nicholas II, the post-revolutionary rulers carried out the industrialization of the country without feeling the slightest remorse at the thought that it cost dozens of millions of lives of Russian and non-Russian people. Quite a few stories can be told of how kind and merciful the Russian emperor was. Here are some of them. One day, Nicholas II inspected a military hospital and saw an armed guard by the bedside of a soldier, a deserter who had inflicted a wound on himself. After a recovery, he was going to be put on trial and face a severe punishment. Nicholas II, in whose power it was to pardon and to punish, said then, Tell those in charge of this man that I forgive him. He has got one bullet already which has punished him all right. Upon the recovery, the deserter was pardoned. The army the Tsar loved the most, and the army responded with love. After abdication, the Tsar thought he declared it for the sake of Russia, the emperor saw the armies collapse and had no peace. He addressed the provisional government in these words. I am asking of you, do take care of the Russian soldiers. I cannot sleep at the thought that the army is starving. However, this plea fell on deaf ears. Indeed, he was not so much a Tsar, but a considerate caretaker of all his subjects. Before the revolution, the chief of the gendarmes told the Tsar there would be no revolutions in Russia for a hundred years, if only he permitted him to execute 50,000 people. The emperor rejected the request with horror and indignation. In the 21 years Nicholas II was on the throne, a little more than 4,000 death sentences were passed for those kinds of offences that are punishable by death in any other country of the world. Whenever the Tsar spoke to his enemies, 
nobody could notice even a hint of irritation. When somebody would ask him in surprise why it was so, the Tsar would reply, I toned down the string of personal irritation a while ago. Anger won't help. Besides, an angry word spoken by me would sound far more stronger than if it were uttered by anybody else. After abdication, Nicholas II and his family started their way to Calvary. God himself helped to carry their cross by uniting all members of the royal family with love. The confessor of the royal family, Archpriest Vladimir Hlinov, who conducted services for the Tsar and his family in exile, recalled that the Tsar once said to him, I cannot forgive myself for giving power away. I could have never thought that it would end up in the hands of the Bolsheviks. I thought I was handing power over to the representatives of the people. It was in Yekaterinburg, in the house where they were held hostage, that the royal martyrs happened to have their last church service. It was conducted by priest Ioan Storozhev, who would later recall. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, both Nikolai Alexandrovich and his daughters were tired, if not depressed. At a certain point I was supposed to recite a prayer. For some reason the deacon started singing out the prayer instead of reciting it. I started singing too. Uh, and as soon as we began, I heard uh, the Romana family, who were standing right behind my back, go down on their knees. Never suspecting that something terrible was going to happen to them, they got ready to die and even served their own funeral service. God permitted that. There was so much light in the humble soul of the Tsar when he said before his death, I order no revenge should be sought for me. Oh Lord, forgive all those persecuting us. A horrible, cruel, demonic murder was committed in the basement of that house. God sent the parents the happiness not to hear the moans of the teenage prince and the cries of Grand Princess Anastasia. Those two were the youngest in the family, and the first bullets failed to bring death to them. They were killed with bayonets. The most innocent and sacred ones took the greatest suffering. Let us remember the names of those killed. Emperor Nicholas II, 50 years of age. Tsarina Alexandra, 46 years of age. Grand Princesses Olga, who was 23. Tatiana, 21. Maria, 19. Anastasia, 17. And Prince Alexis, who was 14. There is no love greater than that of someone who gives his life for his friends, said our Lord. The new martyrs of the royal family sacrificed their lives to God for the sake of their country. They were certain that their country, given to them by God, cannot perish. Amen.
listening to a story about the last Russian emperor, the Saint Nicholas II. The author of this last program in the series The Lives of the Russian Saints is Father Artemy of the Moscow Theological Academy. The series was directed by Vladimir Dyomen, the producer and musical editor Tatiana Shvitsova.